Today is Wednesday, May 31st, 2017. Time for Episode 6 of the Barnhart Podcast. The past week has been, been both quiet and busy for me. There hasn't been very much in the news, has there? Ah, no, no. <laughs> never never anything to discuss. We, we, you know, Super Nerd and I put together these lists of possible topics and th- over the course of the week, and it's it's really difficult to hone it down to just three topics. And even then, you know, any one of these topics, um, Super Nerd made the remark, there was there's one thing, in fact, one side item within one topic, one article that we could just we could go off for hours and hours and hours on just this one thing. So honing these things down is <laughs> is difficult, but we do the best we can and try to mix it up and keep the content a little bit varied. Yeah, and, and there are some topics we're, we're working on that we're just not ready to talk about yet, like uh, U.S. Chinese posturing in the South China Sea. I don't know if they're kayfabing or they're really doing something there. Uh, we'll get to that eventually. There's some more research points to do. Uh, in the United States this past Monday, it was Memorial Day. It's the day we officially remember all the members of the armed services who gave their lives in service to this country. And if the, if we were living in a rightly ordered Catholic society, we would see the Cardinal Archbishop of the Military Ordinate, who is the highest ranking member of all the Catholic chaplains in the armed forces. We'd see him offering a nationally televised pontific, pontifical requiem mass at Arlington National Cemetery for the repose of the souls of the military dead who are in purgatory. Instead, most of us were focused on a different kind of barbecue with beer, and that's about how life is in in, um, in the United States and how much we care about the souls of those who paid for our freedoms and blood. Indeed. I was thinking this week, um, one thing I would like to do in addition to have ideally a benefactor mass every day, I'm at three a week right now, I'd like to have benefactor masses every day, but I would also like to get um, to the point, if it would be possible, I mean, this is a dream, is to have every day a, a requiem mass offered for all of the people who died on that day or the previous day, because, you know, I've been thinking a lot in terms of Manchester and, and you know, just people die all the time. Um, and people are not getting requiem masses said they're having these, these weird, I mean, even the Catholics, I mean, obviously the Protestants aren't having any sort of requiem mass. Nobody's praying for them as, as, for their particular judgment or any of these things. And even Catholics now in this post-conciliar Novus Ordo paradigm, um, nobody is offering requiem masses. If you, if you are Catholic and you have a Novus Ordo funeral, it's this quasi canonization of, and you know, people declaring that you're in heaven. And if it's really bad people declaring that you're an angel in heaven, I think we've talked about this on a previous episode. It occurred to me, we could have a thing where every single day we could have a priest that was committed to offering a proper requiem mass. It would be a low mass, but it would still be a requiem mass for all of the people who had died the pre let's let's say the previous day, so that so that people would actually be getting proper funeral masses offered for them within twenty four hours of their death. Um, so that's kind of a long term vision goal that I would I would really love to to execute. Yeah, execute. Uh, why, why leave it for the, the condemned and Catholic states to have a requiem as soon as they're as soon as they pass away? It's something for which we should all hope. And if if your if, if your only experience of a Catholic funeral is the nonstop hagiography by the priest and everybody else who wants to get up and say something about the person who passed away. There should be take, none of that. It, there should be none of that. Technically, it it's shouldn't forbidden. even be discussed. Yeah, it should be forbidden. No, it is. Te- te- it is technically forbidden, but you know, but then again, there's the law, and then there's what people do. Yeah, exactly. And it's not just the financial markets where that's a problem. But uh, yep, take the take the time to read if you've never read it before the text of the DSE Ray. That is the the oh, sequence yeah. read at, at the traditional uh, requiem mass. That is scary. And and do yourself a favor and, and listen to the music that that Mozart put to it. Mozart's, yeah. Oh, I, I've I've posted I've posted. You know, the Diasiere is this poem, and it's it's quite long. And in Mozart's requiem, there are you know stand basically a stanza or two stanzas of it that are pulled out. And then set to music with these themes. And it's uh, the Lacrimosa is one of the most moving pieces of music I think ever, ever composed. And, you know, we can talk about the fact that that Mozart was a Freemason and all this. But, you know, God writes straight with crooked lines and Mozart's Requiem is is just incredible. And 
again, again, you you compare that to what's going on in these modern Novus Orduus post-conciliar Catholic funerals, this horrific music, and nobody is praying for these people's souls. These people are dead. They have, they have faced their particular judgment, but of course, God is not limited by time, so we can pray for things that have happened backwards in time. And I mean, even discussing time with regards to these things is, is, is a tricky proposition. But we need to be praying for the dead. They are facing their judgment, and it is a, it is a fearsome thing. And we know not only from the Gospels, but also from, for example, Our Lady of Fatima and what she told the children of Fatima. Many, many, many people are lost to hell. And what's not happening? Nobody's praying for these people. Nobody's praying for the dead. So, Or the, we, the sinners while they are alive. For want of prayers, they fall to hell like snowflakes on a winter's day. Like snowflakes, exactly. And I think St. Therese of Lisieux, something was, was said to St. Therese of Lisieux that, that was the same way. She said she saw souls falling into hell like snowflakes falling in a snowstorm. I mean, this notion that that everybody's in heaven, I mean, it, it's it's so wrong and it's so pernicious and it's so of of the enemy. It's so of Satan to convince people that there's just no risk of any of this. And, you know, grandma was a really nice gal. So clearly she she must be in heaven. Well, no, clearly, no, that is not true. There you are a lot of really nice people in hell. There's a lot of really, really, really nice people in hell. It it's just it's it's so evil and so fallacious that we need to start the priests the bishops they're not going to do this and so we have to take it upon ourselves it has to start with the laity and then we have to find i mean you know that's the beautiful thing about having masses offered is that you know for example my benefactors well goodness gracious how many how many how big is that list by now? I don't even know. God knows. God knows exactly. You can have these enormous mass intentions. And because, you know, you're dealing with God here, you can make it as big as you want. So you can have requiems offered for everyone who died within the past 24 hours. And, you know, because God is God, boom, it's done. It's that's no problem at all. So we can have these enormous intentions that will be efficacious all the way down to the specific individual level, even though we don't have any idea who the vast, 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 vast majority of these people are. It doesn't matter. God knows. Yes. And he knows how to route the prayers. He's very good at it. Uh, he, he, yep. knows, he knows all. And on the topic of keeping the eternal picture in mind, you wrote mm. something on your blog this last week about one particular victim of, of the bombing of the concert in Manchester and who the real criminal was. Uh, for those who haven't read that yet, because there are people who like to listen, uh, why don't you develop that thought a little bit more? Well, I mean, that it's been a busy, a busier traffic week. That piece, it didn't go super duper duper viral, but it's still trending on Facebook and traffic is, is still in a state of spike. Um, it's called uh, Manchester, the Brutal Truth. That's what I titled the post. And it was it was exposing the fact that this Ariana Grande, even though she looks like this cutesy pie, um, very young singer with her with her little ponytail and her fringe bangs, what people don't understand and what I even didn't appreciate until I did, you know, five minutes of research on who this person was and what's going on here is that Ariana Grande is basically a pornographer. Her perform her lyrics are pornographic. Her dance moves, her live stage show is pornographic, and it's pornographic in terms of both heterosexual and homosexual. Constant glorification of sodomy, constant uh, – the motif of the sodomite rainbow flag is omnipresent in her stage show. Extremely, extremely pornographic sexual dancing and dance moves, and you all uh, – I, I, I don't want to scandalize and I don't want to say what these people are doing and I don't want to incite people to look these things up. Just please take my word for it. I'm not being I'm a person who has listened to pop music and so forth. And, you know, there's I saw some feedback on the Internet when I when my piece got syndicated, pointing all of this out and people would saying, oh, it's no big deal. There's always been sexual innuendo in rock and roll music all the way back to Elvis Presley. And I'm sorry, but no. If you are making the argument 
that Elvis Presley, even though it, it now as I, you know, move forward and forward in my faith and the spiritual life and learning about modesty and things like this, yes, e even Elvis is was very problematic because it was opening a door to the, to sexualization. But for people right now to make the argument that Elvis Presley is the same thing as Ariana Grande. And if you go and read my piece, um, be warned if you read it because her lyrics are pornographic and I list some of them. No, you know, not all, but in fact, I focus mostly on her most famous hit that all the little girls know and all the little girls sing and it's all over television and blah, blah, blah. And I actually post the lyrics to this song and, and, and I explain what some of the terms mean because they're contemporary slang that if you're above a certain age, you probably wouldn't know, have never heard. I had to look one particular phrase up and it is so spectacularly pornographic. It's when you, just, when you it's, Google it's, it's a term, stunning. it's stunning. When how, you Google a term it and it, and, and the, the number one, two and three responses are urban dictionary. That's a problem off the top yeah, right that's there. Right. That's right. And also with regard to that particular song, something that caught my attention is that the official video is done with a character called Nicki Minaj, who is known very well for her overt Satanism. So Satanism, this is this yeah. is somebody it's not just pornography. It, no, why should we be surprised that these two topics go together? I'm, I'm glad you brought Nicki Minaj up because um, and. If you listeners don't know who this creature is, again, I, I've never heard any of her songs, but I've seen her image on the Internet. She's black. She's one of these people who has injected her body so that her butt is just absolutely enormous. And it's due to plastic surgery and injections. Just this self-mutilated black woman who's. All of her songs and all of her imag imagery are hypersexual and satanic. And we're, we're not kidding when we say satanic. It's very interesting. Um, I've had the opportunity to make the acquaintance of, you know, some seminarians. Um, and there was a, there was a certain seminary and it had a problem in it. There were sodomites. And recently, thanks be to God, this seminary uh, drove a couple of these sodomites out. And, you know, I had occasion to visit with some of the seminarians and, you know, they were relieved and things are better and they're glad that these people are gone. I had, I had met kind of in passing and just talked very briefly with both of these seminarians that got thrown out. And I learned finally the first and last name of one of them. And I said, well, this is interesting. I'm going to do a little Google research here, do a little Google stalking and just see what comes up. Sure enough, I, I typed this guy's name in, in quotation marks, because um, that's how you do a targeted search on Google. If you want to look for just one term, the way you do it, and it has to match it exactly, is put the term in quotation marks. This is a very handy tip for using search engines because it makes things a lot easier because it has to match the term exactly. All right, so I put this guy's name in, pull it up, lo and behold, Ever since he's entered seminary, the whole time, it's not like this kid was dealing with same-sex attractions and was trying was trying to live a life of chastity. This kid was a complete fraud from day one. And what is all over this kid's Twitter feed? Nicki Minaj, Nicki Minaj, Nicki Minaj, Beyonce, Nicki Minaj, Nicki... I, Nicki Minaj is satanic and is is just this magnet for these sodomites. How in the world can a seminary not in this day and age between Facebook, between Twitter, between all of these platforms and all this stuff is openly available on the internet. How in the world can a seminary that's honest and not being run as a farm factory for sodomite sex partners for priests and bishops, let's be honest, how can they not be doing Google searches? How can they not be keeping an eye on social media and things like this that these seminarians are using? It was obvious from day one that this kid entered seminary and moved to the major metropolitan area that he was living in for the gay sex scene. That's why he was there. That's why he was there. And it's obvious. And Nicki Minaj, hello, Red flag numero uno, you have a satanic, hypersexual pop star 
that is known to be a magnet for sodomite men. This kid is all over the internet, Nicki Minaj, Nicki Minaj, Nicki Minaj. Why in the hell does that little faggot, why does that filthy little faggot have a seat in a seminary where that seat could be going to a faithful young man who has a genuine vocation, who could be ordained to the priesthood and eventually offer the holy and august sacrifice of Calvary and absolve people of their sins in the confessional. And that little faggot was sent to this pretty expensive seminary for four years before they finally caught into this and threw him out. And they actually caught into it and threw him out because the other seminarians were complaining about him. That, that was the genesis of it. The, finally, the other, the other guys in the seminary were like, this, we, can't, we're, we don't want to put up with this crap anymore. This is ridiculous. Furthermore, they should send that little faggot a bill for about a, for about a quarter million bucks to cover the expense of all those years of education, room and board, everything. Send that little faggot a bill and make him pay for that. I mean, it's just unbelievable. And it would have taken five minutes of research on the Internet to clearly see what this kid was about, clearly see that he was active in the gay scene. And that's that's what his entire shtick was. And, I that, mean, and that's who one of the big co- co-stars of Ariana Grande is. Yeah, that is one of the co-stars that, you know, there's always a, a rapper and maybe another female singer. And this this Nicki Minaj person is is on Ariana Grande's music. It's satanic. It's satanic. So, you know, if you if you have pious ears and eyes and you don't want to you don't want to see these pornographic lyrics and you don't want to know what these terms are. And I mean, they're they're the kind of thing that are so bad that once you see it, you get a mental image and then it's really difficult to get rid of a mental image once you have it. So I'm, I'm again, I warn you. This stuff is awful. And the point of my piece was, you guys, this chick Ariana Grande, her target audience is preteen and teenage girls. The little girl, the youngest, uh, the youngest victim of this Islamic, um, this completely orthodox Islamic political system act of war was an eight year old girl named Safi Rose Russos, eight years old. Old, who was there with her mother. Again, this this auditorium was filled with little girls who were there with their parents. There with their parents. What in the hell is going on? Parents are taking their prepubescent, preteen daughters to see actual, honest to goodness uh, performances of pornography. And everybody's just completely fine with this. And again, I looked up uh, footage from Ariana Grande concerts. There's a whole bunch of this, you know, people just taking videos with their phones and putting it on YouTube. You can see this and you can see these dance moves. And it is it it is stunningly pornographic. I was going to say it's not exactly dancing. Well, it's yeah, it's not dancing. It's um. It's porn. It's it's performance porn. And so you can't make the argument, well, the parents don't know what the lyrics are. And, blah, and I'm sure the parents were all taking. Uh, no, I'm sorry. When a, a male dancer does that to another male dancer or does that other thing to Ariana Grande, and that is aping a sex act. It's aping, an, in fact, an act of sodomy. Um, do the parents not look at this and see this? They are they are displaying pornography to their own minor children. And I looked it up. I looked it up in, you know, it's a it's a crime in the U.S. code. And then by state also, it varies by state whether or not um, distributing pornography or displaying pornography to a child. It's either generally a third degree felony or a first degree misdemeanor. Every one of these parents who took their children to this pornography have committed a felony. It's a felony to display pornography to a child. What in the hell is going on? Also, what about Ariana Grande herself? What about her managers? What about the promoters of this? These people are displaying pornography to children. They are selling tickets to children. They're letting children in the door. They look out at the audience. It's filled with children. 
eight-year-old girls and they say, yes, let's do our pornographic performance. Excuse me, this, this should be a felony. These people should all be arrested and tried. That, that is where our civilization is. And if you're sitting there listening and saying, oh, Anne, that you're crazy, you're rigorous. No, no, I'm not. I'm sorry. Displaying pornography to children is a felony and it should be it should be aggressively enforced, prosecuted to the fullest fullest extent of the law. There should be massive, massive fines to pay and people should serve jail time for this and be registered as sex offenders. And until until this society and this culture wises up and frankly turns back to Jesus Christ and until Jesus Christ is the king and all laws are subject to his law, the natural law and the divine law, there's no hope. You cannot get on some damn libertarian soapbox and tell me that this culture, that this civilization has any hope so long as displaying pornography to children is is considered completely de rigueur and no problem at all. And that's where we are. And so the point of the piece is, is yeah, this, this musloid piece of shit, he's a piece of shit. Then he murdered all of these people. Who was little Safi Rose's greatest enemy though? How, if you think about this, and we should all be thinking about this because it's possible that any of us could die at the hands of musloids either in a bombing, um, at some point they'll start doing, you know, kidnappings and doing rape, rape and behead, and they'll be putting videos that will start in North America and in Europe eventually, because they're already doing it in the Middle East. That's where all these beheading videos and and so forth come. They're eventually going to start doing it in, you know, formerly in former Christendom. We all need to be thinking about these things. What, what happens if that happens to me? If some musloid comes and kills me, does that really have any effect on my faith in Jesus Christ? Is this going to cause me to, to apostatize? Of course not. No. Th- they can kill your body, but they, they, in a sense, I mean, it's not even really a question of engaging your soul, you know, in a, in a certain sense, if they, if they blow you up in a bombing, well, you'll, you'll die either instantaneously or quite quickly. That's, that's really not doing anything to cause you to lose your faith in Jesus Christ. It's not, it's not scandal in that, in that specific sense. Where is the scandal? Safi Rose's mother and all these other people who are taking their children to these concerts, these people are scandalizing their children's souls. They are, they are turning them into loveless, diabolical narcissists because that is what child sexual abuse does. That's why child sexual abuse is rampant in the, in the musloid culture because the musloid political system is, is basically engineered by Satan to create diabolical narcissists. And it just keeps feeding and feeding and feeding. And um, that's also why sodomites are every single one of them are a clear and present danger to children and why so many sodomites eventually end up abusing uh, either teenagers or or younger children than that, because they are all about. Um, creating more diabolical narcissists. They're about scandalizing people. They want people to lose their faith because their mindset is, if I can't be normal and happy, then neither can neither can anyone else. And so especially when they see children or young people who are happy and normal, it, it, it in a sense, it enrages them and they want to destroy that. And here's something that's very challenging about this. A lot of people think that... Um, even if they have like a sodomite who's a blood relative, like an uncle or something like that, that, oh, he's a blood relative. He would never molest his own blood relations. In fact, in fact, they hate the blood relations even more. And they have more of a a desire to crush the souls and to scandalize their own blood relations more because when they look at their blood relations, they can see themselves they can see themselves as, you know, teenage boys or whatever it is. And they and it's an even more intense sense of, you know what, if I can't be happy, then neither can my nephew, for example. And it, you're just kidding yourself. You're kidding yourself if you think that children are safe from sodomite blood relatives 
molesting them. There's a massive percentage of homosexual men who were first shown pornography or first sexually abused by a blood relative, uncle, cousin, sometimes even father. You're kidding yourself. And so it's these family members who are scandalizing these people's souls, these little people's souls, these little girls. This little eight-year-old girl was on track to just turn into a monster, monster slut within just a few short years. If she's already looking, if she's already as sexualized as she was going to an Ariana Grande concert, is it unreasonable to assume that she is going to start engaging in sexual activity just as soon as there's any indications of puberty at all, you know, a, and with kids as fat as they are now, that the puberty is kicking in earlier and earlier, age 10, age 11, certainly age 12. It's not unreasonable to think that that little girl would have begun being uh, sexually active because not only has she seen this pornography, but it's been ratified by her own mother. Her own mother has, in, in a sense, participated in the consumption of this pornography with her daughter. This is going after the daughter's soul, which is something that the Musloid didn't really have the power to do. He had the power to kill her body, but he didn't have the power to go after her soul in the same way that her mother did. And so the question is, who's the greater enemy to these children? Is it the Musloid scourge? And this is another point that's that people just can't hardly get their heads around. The divine providence and the church teaches this. Saints teach this. Doctors of the church teach this. The, the Musloid political system is used oftentimes in the divine providence to to chastise apostate Christian cultures now, this is like the most apostate Christian culture in the last 2000 years. And it's now to the point where we're, you know, part taking our own kid, our eight year old daughters to see porn performances. Do you think that that God doesn't love us, that he's just he's just going to ignore this and shrug his shoulders? What why these things happen is because what it's trying to do is draw attention to the fact that you people, you ex-Christians, you apostate Christians, you are going off the cliff. You have got to turn back to God and you've got to do it now. And so this scourging, this punishment is just going to keep coming. And people, you know, the whole the whole thing is there's this false this false dichotomy and this false choice. If you're against Sharia law, if you're against little girls having their clitoris cut out with a rusty razor blade and then being made into these de facto sexual and domestic slaves for the rest of their lives, if you're against that, then you must by definition be in favor of turning our little white Christian girls and also black Christian girls and every other race. But, but let's be honest, what we're talking about here is – Western Europe, Western Christendom, we're basically talking about white people turning your little white girls into these monster, monster sluts. And uh, that I want to I wanna, I wanna develop that ahead. point a little bit. There's, there's a term uh, originated by B.F. Skinner called operant conditioning. And it's the psychological process of essentially programming a human being to do something that's contrary to their nature. We do this in the mm -hmm. military and boot camp. Uh, in World War II, the, the firing rate of soldiers was 10 to 15 percent. Uh, most people, even when the enemy was exposed, could not bring themselves to shoot at another human being. And mm -hmm. through conditioning, instead of looking at bullseye targets, uh, man-shaped targets and photorealistic targets, we got the firing rate up to about 95 percent in Vietnam. Now, that came with a huge PTSD kickback that we didn't take into account. But mm -hmm. the point being is that by taking psychological conditioning into account, we were able to program people to do things that they wouldn't ordinarily do. And in terms right. of little girls who should be the essence of purity, who should be mm -hmm. the the uh, the hope for the future, you put them in a in a concert with a bunch of other little girls who are screaming and 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 carrying on and, and as far as they think having a good time and with their parents approval, you're mm -hmm. conditioning them to to say that what is being portrayed on the stage is something they should aspire to do. They have the yep. peer pressure of their own peer group saying, 
we want to do this. And if you have the, the sense of revulsion that you think this is horrible, well, it's not going to be, it's it's not going to be the 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 satanic people on stage who are going to set you straight, so to speak. It's going to be your own peer group who say, well, you're just That's a right. prude. You need to get with it. This is We're just having innocent well, no, fun. You're a hater. You're a hater. You're intolerant. You are a bad person. And this also goes, it isn't just for the sexual, heterosexual sexual activity itself. What this also is, to an enormous extent, is all of this business of all of these fags and all of this girl-on-girl lesbian activity. Children... Because because sodomy and same sex activity is so radically contrary to the natural law. I mean, every fiber of our being is is designed to recognize that that is a horrible, horrible thing. You have to really you have to go to work on kids in order to overcome that, because every child, the first time they see it, the first time they're exposed to it, and I remember when it happened to me, I was about nine years old, the first time I ever saw on television, two men kissing with their mouths open. And I cried for hours. It was it was that terrifying and that traumatic to see something so radically contrary to nature happening. That's why they're going after these kids, and that's why they're putting all of this sodomite activity on TV and in front of these kids now in the context of their popular music, that it's all part of the aesthetic. And again, if you what these kids now, what they have been taught is that if you do not suppress your own revulsion at this, if you do not completely quash your own own revulsion at this, which is good and normal and healthy. And if you do not celebrate and and ratify this, then you are a terrible, terrible person and and everybody is going to hate you and you are you're going to be a failure in life. And eventually it's going to get to the point where they're going to be taught and maybe they already are that it is it is criminal. It is criminal for you to not be completely tolerant and even even a participant in a barosexual activity. That's why all this is happening, and that's why they're putting it in front of these little girls. Yeah, I, I, I have yeah, nothing. Yeah, else, yeah, I have nothing else to add to this. I mean, I, yeah, I, when, I, when I first read your piece, uh, I was shocked, and and I. This is coming from somebody who was in the enlisted Navy for five years, and in mm-hmm. terms of the level of disgusting things that could be said by by one's shipmates, it, I, I've heard a lot, but. Never heard the, the, that. I I'd, never, I'd I'd never, never heard. heard I'd never it. heard these terms, and it just sounded yeah. so crude. It, it's the kind of crude thing that if, if I'd heard that on a ship and someone was saying that, we'd look at each other. It's like, come on, I'd, at least say something creative. I mean, it, it, it's yeah. just crude. That, that I can't say it any f- other way. Physically, physically disgusting. Physically filthy. Physically disgusting. And you know, she's the, the Ariana Grande girl. She's a pretty. She's a pretty girl. Um, I looked up how old she is. I think she's twenty three. They started her on Nickelodeon. Nickelodeon is evil. Disney is evil. They well, it's, it's specifically, actually Viacom, but yeah. Well, yeah, the whole thing, the parent company. They they groom, they find these children, and they they get them into the system. They establish a child uh, a child audience for these stars. So Ariana Grande, I think she started on Nickelodeon, good grief, maybe 10 years ago when she was herself still a child. And she becomes this child star. And then what happens is they, as soon as Ariana Grande reaches a certain age, they then almost overnight transition her from being this child, child and childish star into this uber slut overnight. So that the kids don't even don't even have time to essentially react. They did it with Miley Cyrus. They did it with Britney Spears. It just on and on. It, it just keeps happening over and over again. And each iteration is worse and worse and worse. I was um, visiting with someone earlier today, and we were talking about Britney Spears. Britney Spears came out 20 years ago. I remember it was when I first moved to Denver, and that's when that whole Britney Spears thing started. And she was probably what 16 years old or something. And I went back and I pulled up some of the song lyrics just to to compare. And about the raciest thing that I found 
from Britney Spears was a line that said, I'm not that innocent. And, you know, it was delivered with great uh, with great sexual gusto and all that. And she was dancing around in a skimpy schoolgirls uniform and all that. But the words themselves, I mean, if that's the raciest thing that she said is, I'm not that innocent, imply, 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 dot, dot, dot. Man, that's not what we're talking about now. We are talking about just stunningly, physically disgusting sex acts that are being used as lyrics in these songs projected at children. Each iteration gets worse and worse. Who's the next Ariana Grande going to be? Because, you know, these these things are flashes in the pan. They only last a few years and then they're going to have to move on to the next one. My goodness, what what is the next one going to be? I, I don't even know where they go from here. Um, maybe we shouldn't even think about that. And we should just pray that the Immaculate Heart triumphs. I, I don't I don't understand how how it could get any worse. But as we've learned, it can always get worse. Oh, it can always get a lot worse. And, yeah, we, we've gone from, you know, fill in the blanks with what, what it means that you're not that innocent to just outright saying. And, and by the way, if, if, if this is if this is news to you, actually, I don't recommend looking it up and, and looking at the lyrics. It, it no. is it is scandalous. And like I said, it's an image. It's physically filthy and disgusting. And once you get the image in your mind, you can't get it out. Uh, it's, you know, it, I was told by somebody that if you do have a problem, for example, people who have in the past used pornography and they have a problem of having terrible images in their mind or even just terrible memories, if there's, you know, personal experiences, personal interactions, um, you know, people that you met that that turned out to be that scandalized you and you need to purge your memory of something that it is in fact our lady who is in charge of that. So, you know, talk to her and, um, ask her to help you purge bad, bad things and bad images out of your mind. That's, that's who to talk to. And if you are a libertarian person who thinks that, uh, anything you do that, that, uh, doesn't, uh, immediately harm anybody else, that the, the whole idea of victimless crimes in this case, you, if we're talking about Ariana Grande and the people who go to these concerts, is there any? Let's just say there was no bombing, uh, like all the other concerts that she has. If you were to yeah. make the case that there's no victim, uh, the victim is everybody who goes, who has warped. I used the term before, operant conditioning. They are being conditioned to be sluts, and that has a very negative effect on society as a whole. There are a lot of victims here, and in a rightly ordered society, Ariana Grande would be, would be charged, locked up, and executed. Uh, yeah, offered the sacraments, of course, so that she could die well. I mean, in, in a in a right ordered society, and there's probably people right now listening to the to this podcast saying, "Oh my gosh, I can't believe they just said that." You know, it's the truth. It, what did our Lord say about scandalizing children? It would be better for you to have a millstone put around your neck and to be thrown into a large body of water than to scandalize one of these little ones. You're going after people's souls. We're, we're talking about their eternal fate. Do they go to heaven and, and dwell inside God forever and ever and ever? Or do they go to hell in eternal torment forever and ever and ever? These are the stakes. So this business that, you know, the only executable offense is... I don't know, you know, murder, murdering somebody's body. Well, certainly that's an executable offense, but there are many other executable offenses too. And in fact, you can make a very, very, very sound argument that these crimes that are specifically designed to destroy people's souls are of greater gravity, these scandals. And then it, it can, like, like Super Nerd just said, these things cascade over the entire society. If you're, a, again, of the libertarian bent and you can't look out at this business with this transsexual crap and and all of this, this insanity, the denying that there's even such thing as sex within the human race, this abject insanity, if you cannot look out and see that this all started with these quote unquote victimless crimes, pornography, uh, people argue that prostitution, all of these quote unquote victimless sexual crimes, that is what has led directly to this. 
let's, hey, let's go back even farther. Contraception, no fault divorce. All of these scandals have led, were the direct precursors, direct precursors, and have pointed specifically directly to all of this shit that we're seeing now. You, you lament the fact that your society is falling apart around you, and yet you want to make an argument from the libertarian perspective about all these victimless crimes. I'm sorry, no. If you're still making that argument, then you're just, you're either completely deluded or you're dishonest if you can't see the fallacy in that at this late hour. Yes. And pause. <laughs> and pause. Well, that was yeah, super nerd. And I, we were like, OK, we've got to, you know, watch our time. We've got three topics. They're three pretty big topics. And how long did that take? What was that about? Forty one, thirty eight, five minutes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, well, that's OK. <laughs> yeah, you got to say what needs to be said, you know, so. Yes. Yeah, there, there was other news this past week. It's not just all about uh, Manchester and who the who the real perpetrators of, of not I was gonna say violence, but it is violence to the soul. What we we're just it talking is about. Yep. Uh, there is there is other news. We we mentioned last week uh, at, at the time uh, Donald Trump had had just uh, visited Saudi Arabia, and we talked about that at at the mm-hmm. time of our recording last week. He was in Israel. I was talking to a friend of mine who is a uh, a veteran of the the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force, and uh, grew up in Israel. Is fluent, obviously, and knows knows stays in contact with people there. And and I asked him, is it a big joke? To the folks there, when when some new president or secretary of state has some grand idea about peace in the Middle East and, and comes over and, and and tries their hand at fixing a problem which has been going on since the time of Christ, and he said, yeah, it's a big joke, but they give us lots of lots of support, so we we put on a good show for him. So yeah, exactly. Again, kayfabe. <laughs> yeah. So Donald Trump goes over there, and you know, I'm sure that in his mind he has he has this thought that he will be the one who will once and for all broker peace in the Middle East. And, you know, the Jews in Israel are just like, whatever, we get boatloads of money from these people and they support, you know, we get military hardware and stuff from them. Uh, yeah, just just humor them, let them do what they want. And we, we all know that, that that whole notion is utterly hopeless. There is no coexisting with the Islamic political system, there's obviously we as 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 Catholics, we all know that there's massive, massive, massive problems with Judaism, Talmudic Judaism, et cetera, et cetera. This this is not a situation that is ever going to resolve without supernatural intervention. So at this point, it's all about just moving money, moving arms and it's all a nod and smile game. And that's what that's what all of these pretty much all of the American engagement, it seems to me, in terms of the quote unquote Middle East peace process. Well, there's there's never going to be peace in the Middle East until I don't know, will there be peace in the Middle East after the triumph of the Immaculate Heart? Will there or will it or will it even continue on after that? I mean, with the triumph of the Immaculate Heart, um, she's supposed to crush and then convert most of the Musloids, I, I'm not sure exactly what the specifics of prophecy are or if there even are any specifics. But, you know, we can only look forward, A, look forward to the day that the Islamic, the Islamic political system is once and for all exterminated from the face of the earth. Not the people. We want to save the souls of the people. We want to exterminate the political system just exactly the same way that Every every sane person agrees that the Nazi political system needed to be exterminated from the face of the earth, not exterminating the German race, exterminating the Nazi political system so that the German race could continue and flourish. Um, It's that's that's, again, the the commonality uh, between Nazism and the Islamic political system, you can substitute the two terms. And it, for me, um, especially when I was first investigating into Islam, it, it made everything very clear. Just substitute Islam or Muslim or whatever with Nazi or Third Reich. And you say, oh, OK, th- this is a sane moral response to this. It needs to be exterminated. There's no making peace with this. There's no toleration of this. It just needs to be exterminated. And you made the point earlier that that the the, the Islamic 
culture or or, or lack thereof. The, the the Muslims are going yeah. to be a scourge to to um, chastise apostate Christian. Yep. Yeah, they're, mm-hmm. they're going to be the, the the scourge to chastise the world uh, for their, for their sins. I've also read someplace that uh, until Europe converts, that Germany will also be a scourge to punish Europe. And so it shouldn't be a surprise mm. when you see a headline where uh, Harry Merkel is saying that Germany will become <laughs> a, will become an Islamic state, and Germans have to come to terms with it. And yep. I. I, I don't want to really talk much about that right now because we can go on for another 40 minutes. Um, yeah. But let's talk about Melania. Let's, yeah, talk, let's about talk about Melania. Melania. So the, 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 the trip continued from Israel. Uh, President mm-hmm. Trump went to uh, visit somebody who says, call me Father Bergoglio. And one, the, one of the big things, aside from the, the Pope uh, or, uh, going after Donald Trump for climate who? change. Ratzinger was there? What? Yeah, somewhere. <laughs> well, one of, the, one of the other things, at least to me, is that Melania Trump came out as Catholic. Um, yeah. And it's kind of funny the way the way that was uh, portrayed Daniel, in some, yeah. of the, some of the media as well. So this is the first time since the since JFK that we've had a Catholic adulterer in the White House. Yes, well said, well said. Um, now we preface this by saying um, we are happy that Melania is inside the church. We're happy for absolutely anyone to be inside the church. However. We need to talk about a few awkward things with regards to this situation. The background, as I understand it, is that, okay, so she's raised in, you know, a Soviet-dominated communist Eastern Bloc country. Is it Cro... Where was she? Uh, I'll I'll look it up real quick. Yeah, look it up. Slovenia. Slovenia. Okay, so she's under under communism, et cetera, et cetera. Um, And... She's her father's atheist. So the family is raised atheist and um, she's not baptized as a child. There's no engagement with any religion whatsoever. Okay, where Melania says she's now Catholic, she's now in the church. I would I think we would all be very interested to hear about, Okay, when were you baptized, et cetera, et cetera. We need to have, you know, it would be nice to have some information about this. The awkward conversation is this. Melania Trump is an adulterer. She's not married to Donald Trump. She is his concubine, and they are holding themselves out as being married. They are not. Donald Trump is married to Ivana Trump, his first wife from back in the 80s, who he then left. He took up with Marla Maples and... He, so he civilly divorced Ivana Trump, took up with Marla Maples, in fact, took up with Marla Maples before he uh, before he civilly divorced Ivana, had a child with her. They aped the sacrament of marriage and entered into this phony, fake civil marriage. He then abandoned her and then at some point met and took up with Melania. They have engaged and now in this civil aping of the sacrament of marriage Okay, Melania, you say you're Catholic, you're in the church, we're glad that you are, but you need to talk to an Orthodox believing Catholic priest who will sit you down and explain to you that you are in mortal sin because you are living with a man who is not your husband and is sacramentally married to another woman, namely Ivana Trump. Now, is it possible that there was an annulment here? Um, I, yeah, I, I mean, I guess it's possible. I, I, in fact, tried to Google this and just see if anything came up. Certainly nothing came up. Trump is calls himself nominally Presbyterian. So obviously he has absolutely no concern with this serial marriage. Protestants have no problem with this. It's one of the reasons why, why um, anti-Pope Bergoglio is so popular because he's he's trying to ratify what the Protestant culture has already completely and totally embraced, and that is that it's completely fine to divorce or marry, divorce or marry, divorce, serial monogamy, let's call it, you know, if, if that. Okay, Melania, sweetheart, if if Trump isn't doesn't have annulments, and you know, even if he got an annulment from. Ivana. Well, then he married Marla Maples. So what's the status of that? It it, it seems to me, just looking at it superficially, 
that Melania Trump is not married to Donald Trump. She's living in public adultery with another woman's husband. That's mortal sin. Okay. Melania, are, are you, are, are you living, um, as brother and sister? But even then, even if you're living as brother and sister, it's still a scandal because you're still putting forth the image that you are quote unquote married to a man that is not your husband. That that's problematic. So, I mean, that's the problem I have right now with all of this Amoris Laetitia and all of these things, you know, and even Cardinal Burke saying, well, if if the two spouses are living together as brother and sister, no, even that isn't good enough. It isn't good enough to just stop having sex. If you continue to hold yourself out as married, then you are scandalizing the society. And this is this is not acceptable. Melania, are you receiving Holy Communion? Do you ever go to Mass? Speaking of going to Mass, um, did you have it explained to you when you entered the church about the Sunday obligation and the obligation you have on, 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 on these feasts, which are days of obligation, which if you do not go to Mass on Sunday for no good reason, that is a mortal sin, and, you know, I hearken back to when I came into the church and I went through RCIA and I've told this story before, but it bears repeating because it's very important. So I go through RCIA and what is considered to be one of the most conservative, quote unquote, Novus Ordo parishes in the extremely conservative Archdiocese of Denver. Um, and it was never, ever discussed. And I know exactly why they never discussed um, the Sunday obligation and all of that, because they were very, very keen to not they were very keen to appeal to Protestant sensibilities and not scare people away. Well, I'm sorry, but you need to tell these people the truth of the situation. You are obliged to go to mass on Sunday. And if you don't go and you don't have a darn good reason for not going, that is a mortal sin. Is anybody, has anybody told Melania Trump this? Is she going to mass on Sundays? Is she going to mass on days of obligation? Um, Also, Catholics ideally should not be attending non-Catholic services, okay? what's What's your status there? Somebody needs to have these conversations. And, you know, the famous story that's kind of germane to this about why it was it was very um, instrumental in me turning my back on the Novus Ordo paradigm and and just going wholeheartedly towards the Tridentine Mass is the Easter Vigil after I was received into the church. So I was received into the church Easter of 2007. So Easter Vigil of 2008 Um, I was asked to participate, of course, in the Easter Vigil, and I think I did one of the readings or something. And after all of the um, adult catechumens and um, uh, confirmation, what are they called, confirmandi, um, after that was all done and everybody went over and sat down and it was time for, you know, Father Jazz Hands to get up and give his give his sermon at the Easter Vigil. He opens the sermon by saying, I want to extend an especially warm greeting to all of our um, newly baptized and uh, newly confirmed members of the church. Round of applause. And then as soon as the round of applause ends, he says, And we want to extend this greeting to you, especially now, because we realize that we'll probably never see any of you at mass again. And the entire church erupted into gales of laughter. Basically, they were acknowledging the fact that a lot of these people were coming into the church, not because they were actually converting to the Catholic faith, but they were, you know, a lot of them were coming into the church because they were trying to make a spouse happy or something like that. The majority of people that I was in RCIA with were people who were converting because they had married a Catholic and they just weren't terribly into the whole thing. And that's the joke. We want to extend an especially warm greeting to you because we know that we'll probably never see most of you at mass again. I I mean, it's just, it's just boggling. It is absolutely mind blowing. Nobody's talking about any of these things. Nobody's explaining any of this stuff. You know, if you, if you don't, 
I mean, this is a this is a very bold thing to say, but at a certain point, if you don't understand Catholicism and you don't understand the faith and you don't understand the obligations that go along with it, it's better for you to stay out. It's better for you to stay out. So they're they're getting all of these people and they're getting them into the church. And these people are not being told about the real presence. They're not being told about the Sunday obligation and the, the feast of obligation. They're not being told hardly anything about the faith. They're not being told about contraception. Oh, that's don't even don't even go there. Or now what it is, is wink, wink. Pope Francis is is fixing all that. He's correcting all that. So don't even worry about that. I mean, it's it's stunning. These people are being brought into the church and they're almost instantly just diving right into mortal sin and then diving right into sacrilegious reception of Holy Communion. And so when I saw the Melania Trump thing, my red flag just went up immediately. Has anybody sat this woman down and explained these things to her? Because if she is, in fact, in the church, which I believe she is, I don't think there's no reason for her to lie, certainly. If she is, in fact, the church, which I believe that she is, it's even more imperative that now, guys, we have to start praying for Melania. Because is she is she receiving sacrilegious Holy Communion? You know, is she going to die in this state of mortal sin with the increased culpability precisely because she is in the church but she hasn't researched. She hasn't done what she needed to do. Nobody explained it to her. But again, a woman in her position, the onus will be on her. She will be held accountable. It, Melania, why did you not research it and what, your, what the Catholic faith is? How could you not know this? Um, so, you know, we've said we've had our masses said and hopefully we'll continue to have masses said for the conversion and reversion of Ivanka Trump, who apostatized from Christianity, and of course, Jared Kushner and their three children. We've done that, but now we realize, goodness gracious, we need to start having masses said for Melania. And please, God, send send her a good and holy priest and, and get her squared away and make sure that her situation is okay and that she dies well. And I would also, at this point, someone reminded me, you know, you can't have the expectation of having instantaneous instantaneous results on something like this. We have to remember, we have to look at the long game here and we want Melania to die well. Okay. We want her to die well, but she's also the, the first lady of the former United States. Um, it's conceivably possible that, that her life is in jeopardy. She's a target. She's a public person. She's a target. And also goodness gracious, she's a 47 year old woman. Anybody can come down with cancer, brain tumor, whatever. It could just, it could happen to anybody. We want this woman to be in the church and have a good, happy, holy, provided death, die in the state of grace, repent of all of her sins, have made a good confession, understand it and mean every word of it because we want Melania to go to heaven. And looking at the situation on the surface right now with the information that we have, it looks really, really scary right now from at least for, from where I'm sitting, super nerd. Right, and, and obviously only God can know what the disposition of her soul is, but we have some pretty good clues based on how she lives her life and, and the external circumstances. And as more than one doctor of the church has said, you die the way you live. So the idea of a deathbed conversion, you can forget about that unless you've had an army of people praying for you for a very long time. Yeah, it's that's oh, that's gambling. I mean, that's so gambling, so hard to just say, well, let's just leave it to that. Oh, Trump is so much older than she is. He'll die and then she'll she'll be, you know, released from the the sexual relationship. I, and I know that's not acceptable. We need to preach the gospel to this woman, not be playing these bullshit Vegas odds with yeah, her soul. If you want a Russian connection with the Trumps, it's Russian roulette and it's with their souls. Ah, well said. Well said, sir. Getting into some... Should we call it... Oh, do you want to call it there, or um, what do you think? Well, we've, we've got a little we're bit of listener hour, feedback. We? Yeah, we're okay, coming okay, up quick, at an hour. Quick. I think I think we can do uh, some, some quick uh, listener feedback. Okay. And uh, it's developing a thought that, that uh, we talked about a little bit last week, talking about uh, is there gonna, are there going to be transcripts. And um, 
Mm, with the, no. <laughs> the topic, you know, the topic we were talking about with, with the Jizya, for example, uh, last week, somebody somebody offered to write transcripts, and the the part of the the the, the podcast that they transcribed <clears throat> is a, is a great example of why transcripts won't work. Um, mm-hmm. I had made a comment that for a nominal fee, uh, if you don't want to be a Muslim in, in a Muslim uh, dominated area, you could just pay the the, the jizya tax. Mm-hmm. Uh, somebody pointed out that it's not a nominal fee; it's a crushing tax, probably on the order of what the IRS extracts from people for protection money. It's like thirty, forty, fifty percent based on uh, circumstances. Uh, yeah, that's called irony. And irony, uh, when, when yes. you ta- when you take a <laughs> what somebody is saying, and and uh, translate it into black and white on a piece of paper, you lose all of the verbal context of of what was going on there. So yeah, please don't make transcripts. Um, this this is for listening. And if so, if you want to read something, Anne's written tons on her on her website, and she has links to other things to read. So uh, th- this is a different mode of communication. So transcripts. It is a different mode. I mean, you can write you can write p- prose such that irony, sarcasm, these things come across. And even even then, even then, um, I think it's Gerard Vanderloon over at American Digest. He has a footer on all of his posts that says. Um, I'm paraphrasing here. There's no, it's a quote. There's no way to write such that it cannot be misunderstood by someone. And that's absolutely true. I mean, and I've learned this time and time and time again. I've even started, I, I've made a couple of posts where I was making extremely sarcastic or I was using the voice of the voice of a liar or the voice of the enemy or something like that. And I learned, okay, I'm going to have to take this text highlight it, put it in italics, and then change the color of the font with a note at the top that says anything in bold green italics is irony, sarcasm, the voice of a liar, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's, uh, I, I never cease to be shocked at how many people, God forgive me for saying this, but kind of lack a sense of humor, kind of lack the ability to discern irony and things like this and how you just you have to be so careful now i refuse to pander in a sense to the lowest common denominator because irony and sarcasm these are very effective rhetorical tools i'm going to continue to do it but at the same time good grief you you almost have to just bend over backwards and put up a a a, a las vegas like billboard saying I'm being ironic now to keep people from from misunderstanding you or not getting the joke. But that's that's part of being a public personality, I guess, super nerd. And you'll learn that, too. So and and emojis are not a substitute for irony and inflection. Yes. Emojis are not a substitute, not a substitute at all. Okay, so we've uh, exceeded our 40 minute (laughs) <laughs> target by quite a bit. Uh, we're going to, we have another listener feedback question about uh, why mortgages should only be seven years, but I think we're going to, uh, uh, we'll, get, about, that, we'll, we'll get, get that next, next week. week. Yep. So until next week, uh, happy feast of the queenship of Mary. We've been talking about the, uh, the expectation of, of the triumph of the immaculate heart. And today on the traditional calendar is the queenship of Mary. So the sooner that happens, the better we'll all be off. Our lady mediatrix of all graces, co-redemptrix, pray for us. Amen. And until next week, I am Super Nerd, and we'll see you then. Thanks, guys. See you next week. 